Well, good morning on this snowy day, whoever you are, wherever you find yourself on life's journey, however it is that you are joining in today, you are welcome to this time of worship. What kind of a week have you had? Maybe it's been a full of challenges, maybe it's been very ordinary, maybe you've had some good news. Whatever you're coming in with today, let's put it into God's hands and trust that God is meeting us here for this time. Let's look to the Lord, let's focus our thoughts, let's take a breath and be here to worship our great God. Please join me as we pray. Loving and gracious God, thank you for who you are, for what you're doing, for what you've promised. Thank you for the rich privilege of being able to gather together for this time of worship. And Lord, we're so glad that you're here with us. Pray that you would draw us into your presence and speak to us in ways that we can understand. Amen. St. Thomas. It's good to be together to worship God with one another. 
This morning we have a little bit of a welcome surprise. Ella's going to join us on a couple of songs this morning, and she's going to play guitar for us. So um, we're going to continue in worship, and thank you, Ella, for wanting to worship with us.
This God who is worthy of our worship calls us into his presence, invites us to bring our prayers. So we're going to spend the next few moments doing that. Please join me as we pray together. Loving and gracious God, so many reasons to sing your praises. You have been good, you are good, and you have promised good. And God, as we look back on the past several days, the different kinds of things that have happened, we're mindful of how you have joined us. We're aware of times that we've drifted away from you too. Thanks, God, that you keep welping, welcoming us back. Thanks, God, that you reach out towards us that you include us, that you love us. Lord, you know there are things that are on our minds and in our hearts, people and situations. We want to lift those before you now. Pray for your good work in these lives. Family members and friends, people at school, where we work, those who are dealing with health issues and relationship matters, those who are trying to figure out finances, those who are looking for wisdom and insight, clarity about decisions that lie before them, those who are dealing with unexpected news, those who are waiting to hear something, God, please enter these situations to bring healing and wisdom, patience and strength, clarity. Comfort, too. And we think of the family of Judy Stevens after her recent passing. Oh, God. We know we need you in these days, so help us to walk with our eyes on you, to keep wanting your ways. Amen. Amen. Well, today we are starting a look at one of the New Testament epistles the first letter of Peter. It's all the way back in the end of your New Testament, and if you have a Bible, I invite you to join me as we read some of the opening verses of that first chapter. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you haven't seen him, you love him. And even though you don't see him now, 
you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. These are the words of Peter. Peter, the apostle that we meet in the Gospels, one of the first 12 that Jesus calls into his group. And we know a fair bit of Peter's life from those Gospels. We know that he was a fisherman that Jesus invited to come with him. And so Peter leaves his nets and takes on a new line of work, namely wandering, following Jesus around throughout Israel and the environs. He is often the spokesperson for the group of 12. He's the first to speak. He's the first to say something. And sometimes these comments are full of insight, and sometimes they're just rash. It's clear that Peter is passionate. It's clear that he wants to do the right thing. And it's also evident that he f slips and stumbles like so many of us. In fact, towards the end of Jesus' time on earth, Peter will actually deny knowing the Lord. It crushes him when he realizes what he's done. And after the resurrection, Jesus finds Peter, and the two of them talk. Do you love me? Jesus asks Peter. And Peter says, Lord, you know I do. And so Jesus assigns him a job. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Matthew's gospel will tell us that Jesus gathers all of his disciples together just before he leaves to say that the authority that he has, by the authority that he has, he is sending these disciples out into the world, into the wider world to make disciples, to baptize, and to teach. And this they will do. We see this with Peter. Peter. As we pick up in the book of Acts, we find Peter, now all the impetuousness is gone, all the passion remains, and he becomes a powerful preacher. Many who hear him turn their lives over to Christ. They become disciples. Peter will be so vibrant in his faith, so obvious in his testimony, that he will be hauled before the religious leaders of the institutions that he revered as a young person that he was raised in. But now, these people are opposed to what Jesus is doing. And Peter makes no issue of his allegiance to Christ. For that, he'll be thrown into prison. For that, he will suffer as he moves through his days. We lose the story of Peter about midway through Acts. Tradition picks up that he winds up in Rome, and it's likely that he leaves Jerusalem shortly after the stories of Acts conclude and heads to Rome, and that becomes his base of operations. Probably he'll travel in and out of Rome in a way similar to how Paul traveled. But reliable tradition says that he will meet his end in Rome. He will be killed by Emperor Nero. 20 or maybe 30 years after Jesus returns. But in between the period of Acts and his death, Peter will continue making disciples. He will teach. He will reach many. And among them, this group of believers that are in the provinces of Asia, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Bithynia, these places up by what today is in Turkey near the Black Sea, Historians of the period tell us that people were put out of Rome from time to time by the emperors, perceived as threats, and the early Christians would have been among them, and they are banished. They are forced to leave. Some of them will settle in this region. They seem to be the ones that Peter has in mind, those who have, been, who have left their home to relocate in Asia. When he begins this letter, he introduces them, he mentions them, he identifies them as exiles who have been scattered throughout Asia. They are foreigners who have left their homes, left what was familiar, and it would be easy for them to feel that they were on their own, even abandoned 
and certainly surrounded by what was not familiar to them. You can imagine how they'd be anxious at that, how they'd be concerned. And so Peter wants to write to them and to remind them about a few things and to teach them about a few things. He calls them exiles, but he doesn't see them as having been uprooted so much as transplanted. And if you think about the flowers in your home or the plants in your yard, it's likely that you've got some there that have been transplanted. They started off somewhere you know, at Stauffer's or at Walmart or wherever it was, and you brought them home in a little pot, and you put them into a bigger pot, or you put them into the ground in your yard. And maybe at some point in your yard, you said, well, they don't belong in the front yard. We should put these things in the backyard. And so you transplant them, and you carefully move them from one to the next, and you put in some new dirt and some fertilizer and some water, and with some sunshine and some care, they will do fine, even though they're in a new place. You're exiles, Peter says, but you are also chosen. You have not been abandoned. You have not been left alone or forsaken. You are the ones that God knows. You are the ones that God has elected, to use those words. And Peter wants to remind these people that God is intentional. He's not going to forget those he has chosen. He's not going to neglect them. They're of great value, Peter says. Consider. Consider what God has done for you. In verse 3, in his great mercy, God has given us new birth, he says. It's like a fresh start. And this time of year, we think about fresh starts. Not, uh, in spring, we'll think about fresh starts outside. And this time of year, we think about fresh start when it comes to a car wash. We've been driving around through the slush and the snow and the salt and the mud. And then every once in a while, you pull into the car wash. And this car that was just hard to get into it goes through the thing and the things whap around it and the water comes spraying down and it comes on the other end. It's brand new. At least it feels like it. It's a fresh start. This new birth that Peter has in mind is something that God has offered to these people. A fresh start. Having been in the grip of sin. Having been on the fast track to death. Now they are free people who have life through Christ. That's why he wants to talk about this living hope. He, that God has given us a new birth into a living hope, a lively hope, a certainty regarding the future that is able to stabilize us in the present. Not only does this new birth lead to a lively living hope, but it also positions God's elect, God's chosen ones, for an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. That word inheritance is an interesting one. It shows up in the stories that we read, the movies that we watch. Sometimes there's a scheme because of an inheritance. Somebody wa knows there's an inheritance coming and wants to get it a little bit sooner, and so things start happening. Sometimes there's a mystery surrounding the inheritance. Something's been promised, but you have to figure out how to get it. The inheritance in view here, however, is certain and needs no scheming. What God offers is something of great value. Peter contrasts it. He says it's something that won't perish, spoil, or fade. And when a little bit later on in this passage, he speaks about gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, we understand that Peter talking about the inheritance here does not have in mind stuff or money or property that gets inherited but rather something that will last, that can't be taken away, that isn't ever going to lose its value. This is yours because God has brought you into his family, and you can hold on to this. 
especially when the storms come. And the storms will come. Peter knows that suffering is likely, almost inevitable. He references that, the suffering, grief, and all kinds of trials in verse 6. And these are going to be part of their experience, even as they have been part of his. But when these storms come, Peter wants to say, hang on to what is true. Who God is, what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do. Keep trusting God. He closes off this portion with this wonderful promise, this statement of reality, really, in verse 9. You are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You know, sometimes people talk about having a mantra, something that calms them down, a very short phrase that they repeat over and over. Sometimes people want to get post-it notes and put it on their fridge or on their mirror just to remind them a statement, a saying, some kind of remark that kind of grounds them for the day or the hour or whatever the need might be. This would be a kind of statement that would go on that post-it note that could act as a mantra. I am receiving the goal of my faith, the salvation of my soul. This is what God is offering, and this is what God is doing. God is being generous on your behalf, Peter says. God is sharing resource with you for your benefit. What comes of that, what we build on that, well, that's the subject of Peter's interest as the rest of this book unfolds. And we're going to be looking at more of that in the weeks ahead. But for now, let's go back to that first opening line as Peter addresses God's elect, the chosen ones, the, God, the ones that God has reached toward, those who have responded to the Lord and said yes those who have been blessed by God, those who can count on God being present and real and strong and for them, no matter what. And God, as we think about life like this, we realize how much around us crowds out that idea and how often we get distracted from it and start pursuing other things or think that other things are going to help us or make us feel better or whatever the case might be. So God, help us. Remind us of your grace and of your gifts. Of the family that you've drawn us into the inheritance that is ours that we can start accessing even now. Thank you for the salvation that your people enjoy and the way that it is becoming evident now, the confidence that we have of finally and fully being safe with you. Amen. <clears throat> when we think of God's work, what we see on this table is such a good way of illustrating God's care and love and grace. Because here we see pictures, really, that take us to the cross and speak to us of the faithful Jesus who went to the cross on behalf of all. And we realize as we take part in this bread and cup that the Lord is calling us to join with him 
to remember that sacrifice, to give thanks for that grace, and to live strengthened by the presence of the Lord in us as we move through our days. The bread that Jesus broke, he gave to his disciples. And as he did that, he wanted them to understand that this was his body that was broken for them. And so he said, when you eat, remember that. There were cups on the table filled with wine. And Jesus wanted them to see in these cups, in this cup, his blood that had been poured out. Wine in a cup can look like blood. This blood is poured out. This life is given to free you, to make life possible for you, to bring about the forgiveness of sins, to establish the covenant of God's promise with you. And so as you drink it, remember this. Loving God, for these gifts, we give you thanks. For the way they speak to our hearts and our minds, we're grateful. For the work that you have done on our behalf. For the life that is ours. Because Christ the Lord has died. For the salvation that we enjoy, for the freedom that we have, for the promise of life, life everlasting. We bring our thanks and our praise. We lift you high. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Thanks to the tech crew for Craig and Doug for coming in this morning on a snowy day and to the musicians, to Ray and Wendy and Connie and Ella, thank you, and Mike, of course. Mike begins playing a few minutes each week before 1030, and um, it's a great way to get into the worship space. So I invite you to stop in a couple minutes ahead and enjoy that good music that's part of that. A couple other notices. If you have an offering to share with the Ministry of St. Thomas, you can mail that into the office. You can use the online portal for that. Lent is beginning next week. We have an Ash Wednesday service planned. Again, weather permitting, we are hoping for an outside service. We'll also be offering an online service Wednesday night, February 17. Now, by way of benediction, Words from Peter. Words that sound like they're kind of throwaway lines almost, and yet if we pause and hear them, let them sink into our hearts, weave their way into our bones. They do such good. Here's how he opens the letter. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. And this is how we're closing the service today. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. For whatever comes, whatever you face, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Thanks be to God. Amen.